Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Future Hour. And today is a very, very special episode. Not only it's probably my favorite episode before the Christmas, but another reason is that today we're so honored to have Dr. Joshua Ilu to be on the podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks、Joshua. for having me. Absolutely, and just a super quick background and introduction. Dr. Joshua Ilu is the chairman at Malta Digital Innovation Authority. He is the director at Center for Distributed Ledger Technologies, and also he is a senior lecturer at the Department of Computer Science, Faculty of ICT at the University of Malta. And I'm just cannot help but thinking and curious about you are a man with many talents and doing researches. Across all different kind of fields, would you mind take a step back before I dive into all those kind of questions? Yeah, tell us about how did you get into blockchain in the first place? That's right. So actually, it's it's quite a long journey. Um, I am first and foremost a programmer, and I actually quit school to get a job programming. Um, I I did not find that the education system was something that I was heavily、um, aligned with. And、um, at the time, my girlfriend tried to push me to get into university, and I I scraped into university. I got the grades, but I scraped in, and I loved、um, computer science.、Uh, I, I just love programming, and I decided to keep going all the way.、Um, I was working at the same time, doing some freelance, and then I realized that I love this, and I want to pursue a career in in. Digging deeper, so I, I did my masters and then I did my PhD, and I really focused on the what would be the precursor to the Internet of Things, so embedded systems, wireless sensor networks. But I was always interested in、um, a particular type of technology, virtual machines, which are software that allows for us to run programs on any machine. Um, so it's it's quite a technical、uh, topic, but that was my my love. And when、um, Bitcoin came about, I I was doing my PhD, and I wasn't really too interested. I must say, I saw okay, it's cool, it's a financial application, but I didn't see the magic that this would bring, the revolution. But then I really got interested when Ethereum came about because Ethereum proposed on top of it a virtual machine, and that was my passion. So I said, "Okay, let me dig into this," and I started to realize the potential that decentralized technology could bring to society at large. So that's really how I got into blockchain, and then、uh, that was all always from a computer science point of view, a, a technologist point of view. And then、um, I was helping the government who wanted to become the blockchain island, and I told them, "Okay, how can we help?、Um, we're into blockchain," and they roped us in in helping with the legislation and regulation. And I'm a technologist, and they're very different worlds. I mean, I come from the background of we don't need law; we write code, and we—that's all we need to do. But over time, I realized the importance of regulation and how、um, society needs some form of rules to abide by, and these rules can change over time.、Um, so now I'm also the chair of a regulator. So、um, these two different worlds: technology on one end, which needs complete freedom, and regulation, which tries to control some、um, activity to make sure that society is protected. So I would say that's a, more or less the story. Wow, that's absolutely fascinating, and I definitely want to come back to ask you more about, maybe even share an experience or story about you know being the person to have hands or foot in both worlds. Especially、right. very very interesting, right? About regulation of technology, especially when it comes to emerging technology, let's say blockchain, that is going to have such impact not only in Malta, in Europe, but the whole world. That's right. So. Before that, would you mind share a little bit with us what you all are building in Malta Digital Innovation Authority and also Center for DLT? Yeah. So the Digital Innovation Authority is really a first of its kind worldwide.、Um, in inverted commas, we're a technology regulator, but we do not tell you what you can and what you can't do with technology. What we do is we come up with standards and guidelines. And we make sure that when you're using technology in a particular use case, 
that it is fit for purpose. So if you're building a cryptocurrency or an ICO project, you have the financial regulator who's making sure that you're abiding by financial regulation. But then what they do is they mandate that you need to come to us, the Digital Innovation Authority, to make sure that your code is correct, that it's fit for purpose. So that's where we fit in. And it's not just about cryptocurrencies. We're also technology, software technology regulator at large, where now, let's say, the European Union has proposed the AI Act. And we will be handling the regulation of AI where necessary. And the one important thing that the ethos that I really try to stick by and impose in the authority is we do not stifle innovation. As much as possible, technology needs to be free. And only where required do we impose some regulation. So that is an ethos that I highly stand by. And I think that's important for the world in general to make sure that technology is not stifled. And then, Absolutely. yeah, and then, then when it comes to the center for DLT. So when we were helping the government with the laws, we realized we're technologists or some other lawyers around the table, business, finance, professionals. We all have different ways of talking about the same topic, but we have different ways of going about it. And we realized that blockchain, smart contracts, crypto, this technology is impacting all professions in time. It's going to impact all of us. So we need professionals able not only to look at it from their perspective, but from the perspective of the other professionals. We need coders who understand the implications of law. We need lawyers who understand what they're regulating. They need to understand the code. So we built a multidisciplinary master's in blockchain and DLT. And I would say that is our flagship that we run at the Center for DLT. Amazing. And also on top of that, you are also lecturing at University of Malta as well, right? So among these three things, and of course, I would imagine family time and to read, to learn more and research. How do you separate your time? And what's your like, um, how, how much percentage on each yeah. mission that you are working with? So um, the University of Malta is my full-time job. And then right. the authority, I'm the chair over there. So I oversee activity. So it's not as much full-time. It's more of a checks and balances approach where it, the, right. there's less time involved. However, there's you still need to auto, undertake a lot of reading and you need to under, make sure you're uh, very well versed in the regulation, in the tech. And the only reason why I managed to do all of this is because they're all very closely aligned. So the work that I do at the university on blockchain and DLT, that aligns with the work at the Digital Innovation Authority. The research that I do, is it's relevant to the authority, it's relevant to the university. And the lecturing that I do in the Department of Computer Science at the same university, a lot of it is focused around blockchain, IoT, and some other aspects. Um, so I've been there now for seven or eight years, so there's less preparation involved, uh, whereas in the beginning I used to stress about preparing for lectures, whereas now I, I can just walk in. So I would say I'm lucky that it all fits together in one more or less one role that I need to do. Wow, that's absolutely fascinating. So it sounded like, and also the day we met in Malta at the event, you also mentioned this center for DLT and this multidisciplinary master program is really something that you are putting much energy emphasizing on, correct? That's right. That's right. And... Would you mind sharing with us a little bit like what is what are some big plans that you'll have for 2022 or maybe some listeners out there that if they want to help or they want to participate in any way, how could people get involved or help? Definitely. So I would say um, it's primarily aimed for those who want to specialize in blockchain, DLT, cryptocurrencies. Like that's the whole vision behind the center. And what we're trying to promote is this vision that you do not need to be a programmer. You do not need to be a technologist. In this new world, there's going to be all different professionals involved in this space. And we have a program where we offer for each different individual, not a tailored, but a tailored to the profession a stream. So we have the technologist stream who gets um, introduction to the area in general, introduction to law, introduction to business, but then they dive deep into the tech. So we teach them, teach them how to build blockchains from scratch. If you're in law, we dive deep into the law and give you introduction to smart contract programming. So I would say if you want to get involved and you love blockchain, smart contracts, DLT, or you're interested in seeing how this tech is going to shape 
the future of society, then um, the masters could be an interesting place for you to start as well. And besides that, we also undertake a lot of research, a lot of research focused in the um, intersection between technology and regulation, which again, fits nicely with what we do at the authority. Yes. But then I, we also do a lot of tech, uh, well, from my perspective, a lot of tech focused research, like how can we build the next uh, generation of blockchain technology? Then we have other academics who look at the law and other academics looking at the economics. So it's really this melting pot of um, professionals and academics coming from different disciplines, trying to work together within this context. Well, this is very exciting. And just to clarify, the master is only in person in Malta University or yeah. will be online too, so, in, in, maybe in the short future? That's right. So we started three years ago, completely face to face, and we needed to go online. Yeah, we needed to go online towards the end of that first iteration because of COVID. And right. um, then our second year was completely online. And now in our third year, it's hybrid. So a lot of students joined remotely in the beginning and um, they wanted to come to Malta. They were realizing that in class, they're building such a great relationship between the students and they wanted to be a part of that. So I would say um, out of the cohort, we only have around 10% who are joining online. And next year, we're not sure what's going to happen. It, it depends on COVID. But the long term plan is, yes, we need to go online, irrespective of COVID, to help reach out towards the masses. But at the same time, we don't want to sacrifice quality for quantity in students. We want to make sure that we're giving students quality when they come to our program. Absolutely. So, for example, this past year uh, or academic year, how many students were in the program? So we have 15 or 16 students in the program this year. Nice. Um, we were supposed to have five or six more, but they decided to postpone for next year because of COVID. Hopefully we won't have issues next year, but it seems like, yeah, students really want to come to Malta and I don't blame them yes. because they've created such an amazing environment and ecosystem amongst themselves. And it's, it's fun for even me to be part of it as well. Yeah, I can definitely relate because um, personally, I was born and raised in Asia, then went to America for university, and I realized that uh, although this idea of university and higher education, at the end, the reality is a little bit different than I imagined, but one big and the most beautiful thing for me in this journey is that how to work with other people from okay. different culture backgrounds okay. and the meaningful relationship that came out of that is like of course a piece of paper a ton of knowledge but something else that might come from that who knows maybe friendship or maybe even romantic relationship or partner okay. or business partner in the future right exactly so, exactly um, so i think yeah yes. that, that, that was one of the the aims that we had we want these different professionals these different students of all different backgrounds all different professionals to work together in the master. So hopefully they do end up building this wide network of professionals to come up with businesses and startups together. And I am even aware of some students working together on some ideas and uh, that's yes. great. And what we are trying, what we try to do is we try to expand their network beyond just their cohort. So we have an alumni group where we try to mix all our, all our previous students with our new students through invited talks. And hopefully that network is just gonna get wider and wider and wider. Yes, absolutely. Because I think when I was doing the research and saw on the um, program website, there was a meetup the beginning of December about Christmas yep. and alumni or something like that, which I think is great. Definitely to keep people yes. uh, staying connected. So if there's some listeners out there in the world, they want to, you know, support, maybe, maybe they, in the moment, it's not perfectly time for them to be involved in the master where can they go support i don't know maybe like linkedin or youtube channel or something like that can follow you guys on twitter or um, yeah so i would say us? our most active social media pages is on facebook and then linkedin twitter we don't have a page yet twitter is not really big in malta and we're finding even yes. oddly amongst our students, um, not a lot use Twitter, but we're trying to encourage that because especially in the blockchain community, um, yes. Twitter is huge. Uh, YouTube, we have one video up there and it's something that we've been talking about a while internally. We want to get more content on YouTube. 
But I would say start with LinkedIn, start with Facebook, reach out directly to us, and um, we'll see how we can work together and support. Okay, absolutely amazing. I think that's fantastic. A very important for the listeners out there because I'm sure there's so many people who are listening right now. They're very, very curious. And yeah, I think that's also one thing we connected over, right? Because we're talking about YouTube and and just now, like five minutes ago, we are sharing with me the vision about the center and this master. In my mind, something just came up right next to uh, this uh, this master, which is a Stanford open course. You know how they have, I think they have a separate YouTube channel and they have okay. all these content and the updates are still very, very often. And I can definitely see this program and the center for DLT it could be and it should be on that level, right? Because it's a, right. just a ton of content That's it. that, you know, will be helping so much people. We're inspiring many, many students out there in the world who are wanting to be part of this innovation. Definitely. So. And when you think or when you speak to a number of academics, especially the older academics, they're kind of against going online because they're like, well, oh, who's going to come to our lectures? No, I mean, if I can present and create an optimal lecture online, why should I repeat it? And I can also make this available for everyone. Um, so I think we need to stop thinking about protecting our job and just getting information out there. I mean, if you're good at what you do, you don't have to worry about your job. You'll find something. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. And I personally call a good podcast or a good video or even article, I call this kind of evergreen content, right? Because That's when right. something is so good, it's very different than a fashion trend, right? Maybe something's popular right. this season and then it's not. But when it comes to evergreen content is the time is kind of very, very, uh, doesn't matter that much, right? Because when something is very, very valuable, whether it's today or next month, or maybe five, 10 years later, that people are still going to come back and watching the content to get inspired, to be inspired by it, to get ideas from it. So exactly. Spot on. Like you said, right? If you, it will save you so much time too, right? Be like, That's Oh it. guys, you know, before the class and go, please we'll go on our YouTube channel to watch this, you know, exactly. so that you're much more prepared. And then, and in class, maybe you can just talk about something for like 20 minutes. Then that's it. You know, some updates since, you know, like a year ago or six months ago when we recorded that lecture. Exactly. So. In fact, because of COVID, um, a number of our lectures, we did record them. So pre-recorded, send them to students and use a flipped classroom, then discuss it in classroom. And we can use a lot of that material now um, to just release it. There's yes. obviously some bureaucratic processes. So universities are still very old structures. Um, but I think we should enough. challenge these structures and decentralization yes. is the tool that we can use to challenge these structures. Absolutely. Quick comment on when it comes to structures and laws and rules, right? It's like, it's just a huge pile of things and people be, keep adding, adding, adding to more things. But maybe not that many people being, like you said, are unlike you, challenging these rules and which keep adding more rules then there will be less and less space for people to do things freely. But exactly. It doesn't really make that much sense, right? Exactly. And yeah. I think this is the mindset that a lot of even lawyers are brought up into that we just follow the rules that are written. Well, no, not, not necessarily. I mean, yes, we should follow the law, but the justice system is about justice. What is right? What is wrong? And we need to sometimes revisit laws and challenge the laws because they might not be adequate. And I think this is really where we should be heading to, making sure that the legal system is just, making sure that we're updating the legal system for today and for today's technology. And this is part of a vision that I have, it might take a few decades, using smart contracts. Smart contracts are code that once written, you can't change it. They're guaranteed to do exactly that. No one can change it. No one can corrupt the system. So if we can start to implement digital processes in smart contracts and we prove that they're working correctly, then we don't need to regulate them. We just need to check them once to make sure they're doing their job. Then we can remove a lot of regulatory burden. So we can achieve deregulation through smart contracts, through decentralization. And I would love to move to a world where we get rid of a lot of this burdens on different uh, sectors and operators. Quick follow up on that. And this is exactly written on your bio page about the process of working towards legal smart contracts, correct? I would say this is even one step further than legal smart contracts. Wow. So legal smart contracts is acknowledging that smart contracts are not always legal. Sometimes they can be. So, um, And then we have legal contracts. And often people in different worlds are saying, 
One is saying code is law, we don't need law. And the other is saying, no, you need law. Uh, legal smart contracts is moving towards a well-defined framework to define when a smart contract is legal and maybe you need to wrap something around it. So this, this is a step in that direction. And this, this ideology of deregulation is taking, taking it a step further where we're saying, if we have these legal smart contracts in place, then you can remove a lot of the regulatory oversight and burdens because we have legal smart contracts in place. So it's take, it's challenging the system to then say, get rid of a lot of the oversight and burdens that you impose on us. But that's going to take decades because you have old regulators, old structures that they're, they've done their jobs for decades. Now we need to challenge that to see, can we optimize some of the processes? Absolutely. And Dr. Joshua, really quick, um, do you have a name for this next step yet? I call it deregulation through decentralization, but a lot of people say that this is reg tech, regulatory technology. It is, it is reg tech, but I also see that there needs to be this vision that we want to remove burdens and we can remove these burdens through deregulation. So it's, it's a bit of both. And I really think the word that you picked, deregulation, as the first word there versus reg tech, it just, when I hear it, my brain, or I, we imagine other people's brain, just react a little bit differently. That's right. Right. Exactly. And, and who knows, maybe kindly suggest it may be a perfect opportunity for you to uh, coin this term, Dr. Joshua. <laughs> so, Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> yes, definitely. This is going to be more so diving into your interest and your passion. But first, would you mind to explain to me what a virtual machine is as if I were, let's say, 11 years old? Definitely. So when you install software on your computer, before we had virtual machines, that software would work on that computer and similar computers. So let's say MacBooks and only MacBooks. And you wouldn't be able to run it on a Windows machine or a machine using different hardware. A virtual machine is a piece of software that allows for you to run the same software that you've just bought on any hardware, on any operating system. So it provides this middle layer where you don't need to worry about writing code for different platforms. Okay, perfect. And how did you get into it out of, let's say, I don't know, the other 20,000 huh. uh, interesting yeah. things going on in the blockchain space? or Definitely. in the tech space? So when I started my PhD, I knew I wanted to work on cutting edge tech. And for me, the most cutting edge tech back then was pervasive, ubiquitous computing. So a lot of devices working in the background that we don't even see. And um, I started to just see what people are doing in the space in various directions. And I came across one or two papers. And when I was reading them, I'm, I thought, this is a great idea. And I, I love it. I wish I did it. That was the point where I knew that that was an area I wanted to focus in because I saw my passion in that area. So it, it, it's a sequence of events of reading a lot where I managed to find something I'm passionate about. And this journey, lesser on specifically the technology, I think it's a very important journey for people to go through in life. And I think our education system should be geared up to do this. Let's help people find what they are passionate about and what they can excel in. And that is the direction we should put students in, not just do the same curriculum and repeat what you're told. So I'm very passionate about that sort of mindset when it comes to education. Wow. Absolutely. And it sounded like you and your team and this whole master is really be the change that you all wish to see in the world. And, um, That's right. I'm just, again, I'm just so honored to have you on the podcast to share these beautiful ideas. I'm honored to be um, here. <laughs> definitely. 